All right. So it says we're recording. Don't say anything you wouldn't say in front of a priest or a rabbi or anything of that nature. All right, guys. Agenda for today. All right. Assignment three questions. All right. Go through any problems you guys might have had with assignment three. Um, we do have our examination on Thursday. All right. It is going to be taken during class time, um, taken via honor lock. I'm going to remind everybody where to go to take it, um, show you guys like an overview, make sure you guys are good, um, kind of talk about the types of questions you guys should be, um, you know, reviewing that sort of stuff. And again, remind you where to go to try to um, study for the examination, that sort of stuff. Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and open up the floor at this point to any questions about anything on assignment three. All right. So what you guys got, put it in the chat, shout it out, whatever you guys got. Number eight, you got it, Joe. All right. Um, and give me one sec, I have to bring up what number eight says. I have it on my, my desktop, which is currently not actually connected to the internet. Um, and number eight, number six, number 10, got it. Okay, I'll go through them in that order, guys. No problem, thanks for letting me know. All right, so give me one sec, bringing it up. There it is. All right. Number eight, the multiple quantifiers. Okay, so eight, six, 10, all right, three and four. Okay, all right guys, so let's start with um, number eight here with the multiple quantifier stuff. All right, um, and I'm hoping that you guys have it on your screen, um, but for letter A, it says every rational number X has an additive inverse. Um, the first thing you have to do is you have to make sure you understand what the additive inverse is, all right? And so the additive inverse says that x plus negative x equals zero, okay? So that's our inverse, all right? Um, but what we're saying is, is that every rational number has an additive inverse, all right? So basically what we're saying is that for every number x, there exists another number y such that x plus y is going to be equal to zero. All right, so this might have been the first thing that you guys need to be able to do this problem correctly. All right, and if you ever have questions about like, you know, some of the definitions, um, maybe Google it, like type in what is an additive inverse, all right, and they might be able to help you out that way, or you guys can certainly ask me, okay? All right, so for letter A, here's the way that I might set this up, okay? So it says every rational number, okay? So I'm gonna say for all X in Q, Okay, so that's every rational number, x, okay? There exists a rational number y, okay? So for every rational number x, there exists a rational number y, and notice that this uses the multiple quantifier, okay? Um, every time you have the, um, the exists, you write as such that, okay? And again, I apologize for the bad handwriting not that it's much worse than any other time, such that X plus Y is going to be equal to zero, okay? All right, so hopefully that helps with that one, okay? Um, and then for letter B, um, the one with the derivative, basically you're going to have the same format, okay? Every polynomial P has another polynomial P, P prime, such that the derivative of P is equal to P prime. So the way I might write that one is that for all P in polynomials, okay, there exists a P prime in polynomials. Sorry, this should say polynomials. I can't see your screen. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Sorry, guys. All right, how about now? Can you see it, guys? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, sorry about that. Let me go back then. I'm so sorry. I, th I thought it was showing the whole time. All right. So um, going back, guys, I, and I know I talked through it. All right, but here it is. All right. Um, for every rational number X, there exists another rational number Y such that the sum is equal to zero or the additive inverse. Okay, so sorry about that, guys. Um, okay. 
Bye, guys. Um, now, for the other one with the derivative, all right, um, for all p in polynomials, there exists p prime in polynomials such that the derivative of p is equal to p prime. So we're going to say d, the derivative of p with, or we could just say, you know, the derivative. So I'm trying to think like d dx, although that assumes that p is a function of x. So we could say the derivative p is equal to p prime, okay? So, so hopefully that helps out with the multiple quantifiers. All right, it's probably easier if I give you the actual syntactical form and then going into the um, going into the sentence form of this. Okay. All right. So um, does that help out, guys? Any questions? Everybody feel okay about that one? All right. Cool. Um, sure, Dario. I'll I'll go through five B as well. All right. So um, I'm going back and okay. So we have number six, ten, three, four, five. Okay. All right, so let's go on and talk about number six. Okay. Um, and number six was the one where you had to show it by either exhaustion, example, or counterexample. Okay. Um, so I'll do a couple of these just to show you guys like the process of this. So number six, we have a domain of some numbers, negative two, negative one, um, zero, 0 0.5. Uh, three and five. And because it's a finite domain, we can either show that something is valid or invalid by either exhaustion, existence, or counterexample. All right. Now, in the next section, after we're done with all this stuff, we're going to start seeing that we have infinite domains and how to try to take care of those. All right. So for letter A, um, letter A asks us to show that for all X in D, that 8x is even, all right? So the way you would do that is just multiply every single value in there by eight and see if it gives you an even value, okay? So for instance, we have eight times negative two, which is negative four. And certainly we know that negative four is even, okay? Um, we have eight times negative one. I'm sorry, this should be negative 16. I took half of it, all right, still even. Eight times negative one, negative eight, that's good. Um, we have eight times zero, which is equal to zero. That's good, zero is a negative, uh, is an even number. Um, we have eight times 0.5, okay, which is gonna be equal to four. All right, and you guys get the drift with this. Um, we have eight times three, which is 24. And then we have eight times five, which is 40. OK, so notice what we've done is we've exhausted all the possible examples for this. OK, and what that means is that we couldn't find anything that suggests that it's not valid. So that means it is valid. So we would say this is valid and it's going to be valid by exhaustion. OK, exhaustion means we've we've gone through every possible scenario. Um, and we either get a response or we don't get a or we get a valid um, outcome or we get an invalid outcome. Okay. All right. Um, and then for B, and I'll let you guys do the other two, unless unless I had a specific question about it. But um, for six B, right? Um, this said there exists an X in the domain D such that X square is less than two X. Okay, so um, all you have to do for exist is you just have to find one example. Okay, let's let x be equal to 0 0.5. Um, if we plug that in, um, we say 0 0.5 square is going to be less than 2 times 0 0.5. And if we compute this, we know that 0 0.25 is indeed less than 1, right? All you have to do is you have to find one example for, um, for an existential statement. So this is valid by existence. Okay, all right, that's all you guys have to do with those, okay? It's literally true or false. You just go down the list and you justify it, okay? 
All right. So um, I think Michael asked me that one. Michael, did that help out with that? Um, was there a specific one that you were um, that you needed help with, or were you just going through it and you're like, eh, it looks weird. Um, I just need to see like an example or two or something like that. Uh, if I could, yes. Okay, so exhaustion will work for both universal as well as existential. Okay, now for you, um, it'll be valid for ex for universal and then invalid for existential, okay, for um, exhaustion, all right? So yeah, exhaustion could be used for both. Doesn't have to be, okay? All right, cool. All right, guys, um, other questions I can answer for folks about number six before we move on. Okay. All right, guys, um, number 10. And Braden, I think you asked me that one. Let me make sure it was you. I don't want to lie to people. Because you know, teachers never lie. Yeah, it was. Okay. That should be like one of those uh, those statements that we do. Okay. So this one says to use symbols to represent each argument. If it's valid, explain why. If not, describe if it has converse or inverse error. Okay. So for number 10, um, and I'm hoping you guys can read this. Okay. It says that every, every teacher dislikes grading homework. Um, we should stop right there because it's a valid statement. But regardless, um, Janet likes grading homework. Therefore, Janet is not a teacher. Okay. So the way you would start this, okay, um, is you would define Janet to be J. Okay. So you need to start by defining like some sort of specific instance because what it starts with is it starts with a universal statement and then it has a particular instance, Janet. Okay. So let's say J is equal to Janet. Okay, so we define that. Um, and then what we can do is we can just define this symbolically. Okay, so every teacher dislikes grading homework. Okay, so, um, so what we could say is we could say let P of X equal X dislikes grading homework. Um, And again, sorry for the sloppy, okay? Um, actually, I'm sorry, it should be that X is a teacher. I forgot about that, okay. So we should start with P of X is going to be that X is a teacher, okay? And then Q of X, if I can squeeze this in here, Q of X is gonna state that X dislikes, yeah, that, that's the worst dislikes I've ever written in my life. Sorry, it's at the bottom of the screen, so out of room. So S dislikes grading homework. All right, so before you can even start trying to write some sort of statement, you have to make sure that you define each of the predicates as well as the instance, okay? So hopefully that makes sense so far, right? Now we're gonna say that if somebody is a teacher, they dislike grading homework, okay? So we're gonna start with, uh, we're changing this into a conditional statement, okay? So we're saying that P of X implies Q of X, all teacher, if you are a teacher, you dislike grading homework or um, all teachers dislike grading homework. Janet likes grading homework, all right? So that would be Q of J, all right? So we go back, all right? And remember what we said was we said that X dislikes grading homework, Janet likes grading homework. So it would actually be not Q of J because Janet likes grading homework, all right? Um, and then therefore, Janet is not a teacher. So we would say not P of J. All right. Uh, and this would be a therefore since it's the conclusion. Okay, so um, before we render a conclusion on this, okay, any questions about how we set this up with the specific instance? Okay, everybody good with that? All right, guys, 
So now that we have that, now we can render some sort of decision, okay? And remember, for this to be valid, it would either have to follow universal modus ponens or universal modus tollens. And it looks like that it actually follows the universal modus tollens, okay? So it would be valid by universal modus, I should say modus, sorry. Oh, again, ran out of room. Again, ran out of room. I should have just brought my whole computer with me. It would have been easier. So universal modus tollens, okay? Um, I'll do the next one too, so that way you guys can have two examples. All right, but um, does that make sense to everybody, guys? You start out by defining your predicates as well as the instance. Then you write the statement form or the predicate form, and then see if it follows or does not follow one of the um, one of the different rules that we have. Okay. All right. Um, for the second one that we have, but this is going to be ten B. Right. Um, we have all dogs go to heaven. All right. And then um, we have Fido goes to heaven. Therefore, Fido is a dog. All right. So um, the first thing I'm going to do, the specific instance is Fido. All right. So we have Fido for F. Um, the two predicates, X is a dog, X goes to heaven. So I'm going to call P of X and say that X is a dog, all right? And I'm going to define Q of X to be the predicate X goes to heaven, all right? This one might be a little bit easier than the previous because there's no negations in it. It's just, um, you know, positivity statements, okay? Um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna implement and we're just gonna go ahead and change this into a conditional. So if all dogs go to heaven, that means if X is a dog, then X goes to heaven. Or in this case, it would mean that P of X implies Q of X. Right? Um, and then from there, it says that Fido goes to heaven. So remember, Q is that X goes to heaven. So if we plug F in there, it would be Fido goes to heaven. Right? So it's going to be Q of F. And then therefore, Fido is a dog. So that would be P, because remember, P is X is a dog. All right, so this would be P of F. All right, and what we would do is we would see if it follows one of those forms, um, whether it be universal modus ponens or universal modus tollens. It does not, okay? This one is actually an example of a converse error, okay? So this is invalid, okay? It has converse error, all right? Um, if it were, and I know it's not, if it were P of F and Q of F, okay, and I know it's not, but that would imply that it would be universal modus ponens, all right? Um, but because the Q and the P are flipped, all right, in the order of the predicates, unfortunately, it's going to be invalid, okay? All right, so um, Michael, I'm hoping that helps out. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael Braden. I'm sorry, Braden asked me that one. Um, Braden, I'm hoping that helps out. Um, did I answer your question on that? Or um, were, was there any confusion still, sir? No, it's perfect. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Okay. All right. Anybody else any questions on number 10? Okay. All right, guys. Um, next one we had three, four. Okay. So for number three, let's see what we got. Okay, um, so for number three, it says write each statement using a universal conditional statement. Okay, so an if then statement. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and do three a and then four a, and I'll leave the other ones to you guys. Okay, so for three a, um, it says that if a person plays basketball, then that person is tall. Okay, so first thing we're talking about is we're talking about people. Okay, so we're going to say. For all X in people, okay, um, and if you wanted to, you could go ahead and 
um, you could go ahead and, and define P and Q. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to write it as a sentence because in problem four, I ask you guys to write it as a sentence. So for all X and people, if X plays basketball, every time I get to the end, it flips. So if X plays basketball, then X is tall. Okay. So that's literally all I'm asking you guys to do for that one. Okay, so just write it using a universal statement, which is this. Okay. Um, now for the negation of this, okay, and a lot of students get the negation wrong. Um, the negation form, don't forget, and I'm going to write the form out for this, would be that there exists X in domain D such that P of X and not Q of X. Okay, so that's the form. All right. Um, for Thursday, make sure you have this written uh, somewhere on your note card or you have it memorized or something like that, okay? Um, every time I teach the class, invariably, it's one of the most common errors that students make is writing the negation of these universal conditional statements, okay? So the way you would write this using that form is that there exists X in the domain of people such that X plays basketball and, okay, so notice I'm not using if then, okay? Um, and also I'm using and X is not tall, okay? So that's the negation of that, okay? All right, so that's all I'm asking you guys to do for problems three and four. Okay, make sure you guys have that definition. Okay. All right. So Jackson, I'm hoping that helps out. Um, did that help you? Um, or did you have any any further questions regarding this that I can answer for you? Okay, cool. Not a problem. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions about problem number three or four on the assignment? Okay. Okay. Right, and then, um, Terry, I think you asked me about number five, correct? 5B. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, that's another one that a lot of students, um, they're not sure what I'm asking, et cetera. So yeah, um, let me go ahead and run through that one. So this is 5B. Oh, I got to move junk around again. Okay. All right. 5B says, um, if X is, so we're going to let X be an element of the real numbers, all right? Um, and we have the predicate, Q of N is equal to N square less than 6.25, all right? Uh, we wanna write the domain of Q in interval notation. So essentially what I'm asking you guys to do is find all the numbers that when you square them, you get less than 6.25, okay? Um, probably the easiest way to start this, guys, is by taking the square root of this number. And you guys might remember from Calc 1 or from pre-Calc that when you take a square root, you're just going to have a positive and negative number or positive and negative root. Those are like your critical values, okay? Um, so when we take the square root, so let's just look at this statement. N squared is equal to 6.25, all right? Um, if we take the square root of that, and if you guys can verify this for me, n would be equal to plus or minus, I think that's 2.5, right, guys? Because I know 25 squared is six, 625, all right? Um, if that's wrong, somebody throw it in the chat. Okay, cool. Thanks. P appreciate it, Jackson. All right. Now, you guys might remember from pre-calc or from calc one, if you're doing an inequality, these are critical values. And so what you're going to do is you're just going to draw a number line with all the critical values, okay? So you have 2.5 negative, and then you have 2.5 positive. Um, and then you guys might remember, you just pick test values that fall within those intervals. So like negative three, zero, and three might be three good values. And what you're gonna do is you're just gonna plug those values back into the original predicate, okay? And you're gonna see 
whether it makes it valid or invalid, okay? So if I throw negative three back in and square it, that's nine. And clearly that's not less than 6.25. So I know that anything less than negative 2.5 is not part of my solution or my feasible domain. If I plug zero in, zero square is zero, which is indeed less than 6.25, okay? So anything between negative 2.5 and positive 2.5 is in the solution set. And then finally, if you guys were to plug in positive three, three squared is nine, which is clearly not less than 6.25. So that is not part of the solution set. OK, so the only values that are in the, the domain of this or the solution set are between negative 2.5 and positive 2.5. And by the way, I bet you a lot of you just went through and you just figured it out without doing any of this stuff. Right. You just kind of trial and error. it. OK, that's fine, too. I don't care if you guys trial and error it. I was just showing you guys the algebraic way of doing it, the analytic way, rather than just plugging in your calculator or graphing it. Notice that we have a less than sign. So what we're going to do is we're just going to put parentheses and not brackets on the endpoints, okay? And so the feasible domain for this would be that x is an element of the interval negative 2.5 to positive 2.5, okay? Um, that's the domain of all values that makes this a valid statement, okay? All right, so hopefully that's helpful. All right, um, Daryl, just making sure that that makes sense. And um, did you have any other questions about that or um, did that help explain it? Uh, professor? Yes. I have a sub question to this. Uh, so what I did is I used the idea of the universal knowledge that, that X squared is a shape of a U that crosses a threshold twice. Is that acceptable as justification? Absolutely. Right, guys. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, graphically, clearly you guys can see that these points right here are negative 2.5 and 2.5. If you were to graph the function x squared minus 6.25 equals zero, right, guys? Um, and so graphically, these or geometrically, that's actually a pretty smart way of doing it, by the way, um, to see geometrically what the domain of values is, okay? So yeah, sure, that's another great way to do it, okay? Um, you guys could have used like Excel and maybe figured it out that way. Um, all I really care is that you guys were able to do it, okay? I didn't ask you guys to verify it. So, um, so yeah, that works nicely, good job. All right, guys, um, any other questions I can answer for folks about anything that was on e either problem 5A Okay, or 5B, excuse me, um, or any other problems that were on assignment number three before we move on. Okay, 9A confusing me with the parentheses in the statement. Sure, okay. So, hold on one sec, Jack. So I gotta bring it up. Oh, okay, yeah, assume that X and Y are non-zero. Okay, um, that really, really the whole reason that that's there is because if you don't have those, then you could throw in any real value. All right, and x if x or y were zero, um, and there is no multiplicative inverse to be able to find that. Okay, so that's just basically making it so that you could do the problem. Okay, so um, so you can basically ignore those, but but I'm happy to write it out. Okay, so for the negation for this, okay, just the general form. Um, if you have the form for all x in domain D, there exists y in domain E such that p of x, y. Okay, so that's the initial statement. The negation of that would be that there exists x in domain D such that for all y in domain E, sorry, my chat box is in the way there, not p of x, y. Okay, so that would be the negation for that. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're just literally going to write the negation, okay? Um, and you don't even have to worry about the parentheses, all right? They're just there to make sure that the statement makes sense. And so the way we would write for 9a, the negation would be that there exists x in the real numbers um, such that 
for all y in the real numbers, okay? And we would say not x, x y equals one. So that would be x y is not equal to one, okay? And that's it, okay? So, um, so Jackson, does that make sense about the parentheses there? The reason that's there is just for the domain. Um, if x were zero or y were zero, then it would make it so that the statement will be false no matter what, okay? Just because there would be numbers that make it um, not equal to one, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but if not, let me know and I'll be happy to um, try to give a more detailed explanation. Perfect, okay, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. A lot of times when I put stuff in parentheses, guys, it, it's just to make sure that whatever you get for the answer or whatever the original problem is, there's no contradictions or there's no um, unique cases that can kind of, um, that could have domain implications. Okay, cool. All right. All right, folks. Um, anything else about assignment number three that I can help you all out with? Okay, um, if you guys do have extra questions, I'll certainly hang out and I'll answer anything you guys might, guys might have after we're done. Okay, now I did want to talk a little bit about the examination just to make sure that you guys are okay with that. And if you had any questions, I could answer those questions for you. Okay, so, um, so first of all, guys, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that I do have a number of resources to help you guys prepare for the exam in Blackboard. And I just want to remind you of those. So. Uh, I'm going to go into Blackboard, okay, and let me make sure everybody can see that. Okay, I did it a couple of times. Um, if if somebody can't see Blackboard at this point, just um, throw it in the chat or just say, "Hey, I can't see Blackboard." It should be coming up on your screen, okay. Um, so just go to the course. All right, and I'm going to enlarge this just a little bit, just because I know my surface is small. Um, and a few things, okay? So first of all, to prepare for the examination, which I'm hoping some of you guys have already done, or most of you, um, go to the examinations link. And there, a few things are, are going to be helpful for you guys, all right? I have some old examinations, okay? So if you click on that, just click on the, um, that link and you guys can see that I have exams from last or a couple springs ago and then I have exams from you know several falls ago okay that should give you if you look at these two exam ones that should give you a pretty good idea of what I'm going to ask you okay and also the format okay um what I might recommend you guys do is look at those first to kind of see like, you know, what types of questions I'm going to ask, all right? I do that so that way you guys can kind of get inside my head and you guys can know like, you know, the formats, but quite honestly, the way I format my assignments or the, the exams is I literally just look at the assignments and I pick questions from there that are similar, okay? All right, so that's one thing that you guys should do. If you've never used Honor Lock before, Okay, another thing I would recommend is that you use this honor mock test. Um, and what that'll do, guys, is that'll just basically go through the process of being able to log in, all right? So that way, you know, you're not getting to the ex actual exam and, you know, it's like 11.05 and it's like, oh crap, I can't log into this. Um, I have no idea what's going to go on. I can't take my exam. Now I have to take the class exam again, that sort of stuff, because, you know, I can't pass the test. All right, so... I would recommend strongly that if you've never used Honor Lock, or even if you have, you just haven't used it this semester, go ahead and use this Honor Mock test. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna walk you through the exact login so that way you guys can get to it to the exam. Um, below that are the instructions. Okay, so this is literally what's going to come up on the screen. I just copy and paste this. Um, I also posted what I post for the honor lock folks. Okay, honor lock are people that are gonna watch it to make sure that, you know, you guys aren't looking at cell phone, you guys aren't flipping back between different screens, all that stuff, okay? Um, so um, realistically, guys, your student ID probably works better, but they will let you use a driver's license, all right? Especially if you haven't been to campus and you can't get here to get a student ID, okay? Um, here's a list of topics, all right? Um, so if you wanna know the topics, um, there they are. 
but also looking at those previous exams would probably be helpful as well. All right, and you'll see those by default, right? Um, and then finally, even though it's hidden, the exam's gonna be here, all right? So notice it's hidden right now, but it will show up. It'll just be underneath the instructions. You guys are gonna take the examination. I do give you guys four hours to take the exam. Um, realistically, um, I've never had anybody come close to hitting that mark, but I'd rather just give you guys the time rather than not. So that way you're not sitting there pulling your hair out, worried about the time. All right, most students get done in about an hour, okay, maybe an hour and a half. All right, so um, like I said, I've never had any student hit the four hour mark with this. All right, so, but I'd rather do it than not. Once you guys are done, you guys are gonna um, exit out and you guys are gonna have 10 minutes to be able to send me your examination, okay? And you'll send it to me just like you guys do the assignments as a PDF file only, okay? Um, any questions about how to access the exam any questions about um, submitting the exam and when you guys are going to take it? Okay, you guys are going to take it during class time on Thursday, right? And the reason I do this, and I hate to say it, I've had students, I, I used to give like a 48 hour window for students. Guess what happened? Somebody was dumb enough to take the exam, give it to someone else, and the other person put the exact same wrong answers. <coughs> Excuse me. So I had two people with the exact same exams, the exact same wrong answers. <coughs> and so unfortunately they kind of messed it up for everybody. Um, so sorry about that, but you know, can't trust everybody. So, all right, so any questions guys? Okay, um, I did get a few people to request to take it in the test center. If you want to take it in the test center, okay, you have to email the test center, you have to be able to take it during class time, and you have to let them know as soon as possible, because I have to email them a copy of the examination so that way you guys are ready for it, okay. Um, if you do it in the test center, it'll be a paper pencil exam, all right, and you would just do it on separate paper, and then they would email it to me. All right, so the other thing I wanted to show you guys was, um, just in case you haven't looked at it, there are... Um, what you guys are going to do is you guys are going to go to the files and documents link. Okay. Um, and there's this folder right here that says approved materials for exams. Okay. You're going to click in there and there's this guy right here or girl, I don't want to be gender biased, but there's this Boolean equivalence and basic rules of inference. Okay. That's going to be the thing with all like your De Morgan's law, um, your transitivity property, your modus ponens, that sort of stuff. You guys are going to print that out and you're going to be able to use it for the examination. Okay. Um, don't write anything else on it. Everything that you got, if you, and I'm going to ask that you hold it up to the screen. Okay. If you don't hold it up to the screen, the honor lock person is going to say, hey, you got to hold it up to the screen. Teacher asked for me to do this. Okay. Um, just to make sure you guys haven't written anything on it beforehand, okay? So make sure you guys print that out, okay? Have it for yourselves, okay? It's the exact same page that's in the guided notes in sheet one, okay? Um, another thing that will be helpful for you guys, if you haven't used it yet, is to go to the exam reviews link, all right? Um, and two documents in here that are going to be helpful, the exam one review, okay? Those are, again, literally old test questions. Um, and then also the solutions, okay? And if anybody's looked at the solutions, which I'm hoping you guys have, um, it's not just the answers, but I go through and I actually work through the problems, okay? This is precisely what I expect you guys to do on the examinations, okay? So if you want to benchmark as to, you know, what do you expect on the examinations, like what detail, okay? This is what I expect from you guys, okay? So notice like for the problems where I ask you guys to verify using Boolean algebra, which I absolutely will, you guys are gonna go through each of the steps and then you guys are gonna justify it, okay? And most of you guys did a really good job with this one assignment one, okay? Um, for the problem, and there will be one of these on the exam where I ask you guys to be able to verify a logical argument form, okay? What you guys are gonna do is you're gonna go through and make sure you say it's given or it's from step one or step two. And then you're gonna tell me which rule of inference you use to justify the conclusion. Okay, so 
look at these, look at the solutions, okay? So for those of you guys that might not know, I do post the solutions to every assignment as well, okay? Um, to find those, just go in files and documents, look here, solutions to assignments and exams. All right, um, and then here they are. I'll release assignment three tonight when everybody's submitted it and I've graded it and returned it for you guys, okay? So that way you guys can look at the solutions if you made an error, okay? So lots of resources for you guys to be able to kind of go back um, and resolve any errors prior to the exam that you might've made, okay? All right, so um, I just wanted to make sure that nobody had any questions about the examination at this point, all right? So um, questions that I can answer for anybody about the format of the exam, um, any questions about, you know, what to expect to see on the exam, any questions about how to study for the exam, that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to trick you guys. All right, really. What I'm trying to do is try to give you like a benchmark as to what you should be shooting for. Um, realistically, mathematics is a skill based class. And so when you guys are done with the class, I wanna make sure you have those skills. Um, it's just like, you know, if you were throwing a baseball or if you were trying to play guitar or something like that, you know, um, I wouldn't try to trick you guys by putting something on there that wasn't on there. Okay, good question, by the way, Joe. Um, can you use a calculator on the examination? Um, everybody may use a calculator. I also do have on the screen, a scientific calculator that's available through HonorLock. The only calculator you may not use is one that contains a computer algebra system in it, okay? And a lot of students will ask me, how do I know if my calculator has a computer algebra system? It's really easy. If your calculator can take a derivative of a function, it has a computer algebra system in it, okay? So, but yeah, absolutely. Make sure, in fact, I would encourage you guys to have, bring a calculator with you. So that way, when you guys are doing like those number bases, you don't make like a silly error or something like that where you add up a couple numbers. So go, um, good question, Joe. All right. Okay. Other questions, folks, that um, about the examination. Okay. All right, friends. I'm going to uh, one more time. Um, no TI eighty four. Um, Newton, I think TI eighty four is okay as long as it doesn't say CAS in the upper right hand corner. So, for instance, hold on a sec. Not that you guys can see it, but um, here's a TI-84. It's probably the best picture you've seen all day because it covers up my face. Um, in one of the two corners, if it is a computer algebra system, it will say CAS up there, okay? Um, this one does not say CAS, so it's fine, okay? So Newton, if yours doesn't say CAS, you're good to go. Um, realistically, guys, you can just use a four function calculator and you'll be fine for the exam, okay? I'm not asking you guys to graph anything. I'm not asking you guys to be able to do any sort of, you know, algebra that's really off the chain or anything like that. So, so realistically, if you have something that adds, subtract, multiply, divide, you should be okay. Okay, but good question. Thanks, Nathan. All right. Um, other questions, guys, I can answer before I pause and the, um, the recording or anything like that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.